Wow, what a day. Lovely. Bristol weather. Is it always like this? Always. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was snowing in New York yesterday when I, when I flew out here, so uh, much, much better here, I think. So, um, hello, thanks for having me over. Um, uh, my name is John Azraya. I'm the language design lead for Kirushna, um, which is Microsoft's uh, language for quantum computing. Um, we're going to have uh, a, a sort of an introduction to the, the development kit uh, over here, and then um, there's, there's a workshop downstairs after lunch that I'll basically take you down a deep dive. Um, so if you have more questions, feel free to uh, assail me at your convenience. What is the Microsoft Development Kit? Well, so Microsoft um, announced its play in the quantum space a few months ago. We, um, you know, we announced that we're working on a qubit, uh, just like everybody else has got qubits, um, we're in that place too. But the story doesn't end there. I mean, we've been investing in this quantum computing effort for almost <coughs> more than a decade now. And we've recognized that uh, once you get the qubit, then the next question is, what do you do with it? How do you actually use the thing? And uh, you might want to actually write some programs and try to actually solve some problems. And we've got like a handful of um, potential candidates of, of the kind of problems that we can solve with quantum computers that you can't solve classically. So obviously that's the overarching motivation for why we need a quantum computer in the first place. But um, so the effort that Microsoft has is not just about trying to build the one qubit, but also to build a scalable, complete quantum system that you can uh, use and interact with. And that comes in multiple layers, um, you know, in very, very broad terms. There's a, there's a quantum device that probably is going to sit in a dilution fridge somewhere, at least with our technology. Um, and we have to control the thing, and that's going to be sitting at probably 15 millikelvin or so. So you need something that actually can interact with it without thermally poisoning the environment. So uh, you know, we want to run the, the classical control thing at maybe 4 Kelvin. Um, that's an engineering difficulty as well. We haven't got anything that runs a full kernel in the industry these days. So you've got to invent that. Then you've got to invent the wires that actually connect from full kernel to 15 millikelvins. That's another interesting piece of work. And then somewhere along the line, um, you might want to actually program the thing. So we need to have a way of actually interacting with the system. So uh, Microsoft's story is actually we are attacking all fronts at the same time. So there's people working on the qubit, there's people working on the cryogenic control and all the other industrialization. And ultimately, you have to, you have to bring this out into a, a commercially viable package, which means that you have to put the thing in an environment that runs in a data center, and some 18-year-old with a ball peel hammer is going to have to find a way to actually maintain the thing. So you have to industrialize it, the, the thing to that point. Um, and then, of course, at 300 Kelvin, um, or slightly warmer, um, you you want to sit and write software, and so we need to find a way to unify that, that approach. So what we have is a team in Redmond that works on um, putting together the quantum algorithms that we know about, uh, inventing ones that we don't know about yet, and uh, uh, my job is to actually support that environment and the effort by allowing them to express quantum computation in a way that is scalable and, and easy to use from a software engineering perspective. So my background is not on the physics, it's more around the lines of uh, um, plain old software engineering, and uh, that's what I bring to the picture. So in effect, what we have in the software development kit that we, we brought out in December last year is effectively this top layer. We have a new language, a classical runtime that runs on your local machine, a simulator for up to about 25 qubits or so. Um, if you want to actually run against a simulator in the cloud, you can do that as well. And then there are interesting tools that help you characterize the algorithm. So you can run uh, a program uh, where all we have is a simulator that does gate counting, for example, or uh, calculations of how many qubits you might need. And that actually helps you characterize your algorithm even without a computer that can run the thing. And 
in that study that would be quite useful because now you can tune your algorithms and improve them to increase their uh, efficiency without even knowing what the results are going to be. So even though it's early days across the board in the industry in terms of having real viable quantum devices to run on, we think this is important and actually useful right now to be able to um, bring value to, um, to developers and also allow you to embed that value in a program that doesn't um, it, you know, lose its value once you have the device. You can just run the same program against the device. So a very simplistic view, um, you know, as I alluded to, we have this sort of coprocessor model where the classical program actually runs on a normal machine, and we treat the quantum devices effectively a coprocessor to do the complex computations. So logically, it looks something like this, where uh, we have a simulator and a simulator in the cloud, a local simulator, that simulate um, quantum state, uh, you know, full waveforms in terms of like, you know, complex matrices, and so you're limited by classical memory and so on. And once we get the, the actual device, well, it'll do its magic. So the, the, that's the overarching sort of point of why we're doing this. And now comes the interesting question, right? Why do we need a new language? I think this is the first most uh, sort of pointed question that I get asked all the time. You know, we already have Python with libraries. We already have Haskell and Quipper. Why create a new language and add an extra hurdle in that, in some sense, to, to get to quantum computing? I think the answer is actually that when you build a, a language, you can build something that is more than a circuit description language. So all the languages that are there at that moment with the libraries that are there effectively help you to formalize a circuit that you draw out and then execute that. But programming language that describes a construct is strictly more powerful because there is no way, for example, to iterate in a circuit diagram. Whereas a programming construct that allows iteration allows you to express programs that are strictly more powerful than what you can actually express in a, in a, in a standard circuit. Further, there's a separation of context. Once you write a piece of computation in a library, uh, against a library, um, you're conflating two type universes. There's a type system that is actually representative of the quantum world that you're trying to express in the quantum computation. And there's the type system of the host language. And they're the same thing in that in the in the context of say Python. In this particular approach, we are trying to make it so that you can express quantum idioms in their own type universe and the classical stuff in its own type universe. And this leads to some interesting benefits. So if you're concerned about just simulation and retargetability, the approach that we have in the state of the art right now with the language and the library is perfectly adequate. There's actually no need to move forward from there. However, if you want to actually try to get a software engineering approach married on top of it, where you can actually consider the concept of a, of a, a, a unique quantum idiom, for example, then we are talking about trying to do what a compiler does with the library, effectively. So the ability for us to actually build new blocks of stuff, be able to do reasoning over um, entire sequences of, of computation, and be able to even do verification in terms of type safety, in terms of uh, the quantum types, um, you, you're much better served with a new language that has formal semantics that allows you to then lean on the 50 years or so of, um, of language design and language theory um, to build uh, a way of expressing quantum computing um, in, a, in a more rigorous form. And the need for reasoning is actually a very real thing. For example, we can actually automatically optimize the reasoning over the code that you can pick up dirty ancillary and actually use them in the code. And 
by that reduce the amount of actual uh, number of qubits you actually need. And so resource estimation becomes the easier because you are able to look at whole program optimization and not just looking at the execution of library calls to try and figure out what's going on. You're actually able to look at the sequence of the thing and say, oh hey, this thing is going to be this many qubits. This thing will run in parallel, so you need more, this many more. And that kind of whole program optimization is really the kind of uh, thing that we shoot for in, in order to make the, the, the approach for generating quantum programs uh, industry scale. And there's a little bollocks that we get out of this, and that is you can do symbolic computation. And that's what the compiler effectively does when you say, hey, I have this unit tree, I've decided, I've defined what the, the sequence is that, that creates the unit tree. Um, can you figure out the adjoint for me? Now, in a normal um, library-based approach, you have to maintain both the, the code and its adjoint. And if something changes over here, you have to actually physically go and make sure that you're managing both the code and its adjoint appropriately. Um, whereas, we can uh, generate adjoints automatically in most cases. Similarly, we can optimize for uh, the application of control qubits uh, to create control versions of, of, of unit trees and so on. So, and this actually is more sophisticated than I have let on because there's a well-defined algebra for this, this kind of functor. And the application of two adjoints returning the, the, initial adjo the initial operation to begin with is actually expressed formally in terms of an algebra that we can apply at the time when we do the, the, the compiler optimization. All of this simply goes to say that, you know, the compiler is there to make sure that your life becomes easier and it does a lot of the heavy lifting that you would normally have to do otherwise. And it's at that level of abstraction that you're actually able to, to free yourself to think about the, the expression of quantum programs at a higher level where you're not worried about the mechanics of how something is done and you only worry about the intent and the semantics of what it's doing. So I think that's in effect the strongest argument that we have <coughs> in terms of um, what Q -sharp, um, why QSharp exists. Um, how are we doing on time here? Okay, excellent. So uh, we have familiar blocks and uh, syntax and um, it looks kind of like C-sharp or Java, but the similarity is misleading. Uh, it's a heavily functionally um, influenced language, and it's got an extremely strong type system, along with a strong algebra that sits on top of you know the functors side of things. And we have automatic management of uh, resources like qubits. Um, I'm happy to show you some code, but at the moment I would prefer um, to keep some time open for questions, and uh, I will um, walk through a full board tutorial of QSharp um, in about an hour's time after lunch. Can anyone see this code? Is this code too small? Yeah. Is it cool? All right. So this is, for example, the kind of tooling that we already have. Microsoft has been in the tooling business, the software development tooling business for many years now. So we have best of breed development environments that actually allow you to do debugging and so on. So, for example, I'm going to um, uh, teleport a Boolean value between two um, qubits called here and there. And I'm going to actually, so the host program looks like that. <coughs> and all that it's doing is first trying to teleport true and then teleport false. So I'm going to put a breakpoint. And I'm running against the, a simulator. The simulator is effectively an external <coughs> process. So as far as this program, uh, the program is concerned, it doesn't know that it's running against a simulator. It thinks it's running against some device that gives it the ability to do you know, single gates and, uh, and gate operations on it. And if I now start the program, it's going to um, come and hit a breakpoint and allow me to actually validate what the value of flag is. And I can see that flag is true because that's the value that came in. 
and I can now step in and see that I'm going to call X on the kilo, which is what I would have been trying to do if I looked at the circuit, I'd be trying to synthesize what actually happens at each stage. I can now walk through this and, and debug what's going on. And of course, I have output. So let me just run. And this time, it's false. And for those who can take my word for it, uh, we teleported true and false successfully. At least that's what it says over there. Um, that's effectively a quick demo. But I'm going to dive in much, much deeper into the language and its, its constructs going forward. So you're welcome to come and ask me further questions and so on. So I'll open the floor for questions at the moment. And uh, um, you know, oh, one more thing. This stuff is actually available and ready to use, so you can download it. Uh, I'll leave this up here so if anyone wants the resources, you can have them. And now you can uh, ask me any questions you have. Let's thank John for his talk. <coughs> Can't see live demo always. <laughs> Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask John? I thought of a bunch. Oh, no, oh, you get for kids. <laughs> thank you, very interesting. Um, when we think about squeezing the maximum performance out of the current computing hardware, um, at least I uh, think about hand tuning assembly code. Um, and you know, there's <coughs> an enormous activity on people who are, uh, you know, have magical capabilities on uh, you know, squeezing many zeros of performance out. Um, this, you know, this is something that we do today uh, on quantum hardware yeah. because it's so scarce. And so we regularly will think about how best, you know, to, to maximally optimize sure. uh, the performance. Um, this Q-sharp seems to be going in the automated you know, compiler type direction. Uh, do you see some kind of conflict here? No, I don't actually. I think it's the natural consequence. Um, you're as old as I am, which you're not. But um, I remember how, do it, how we used to do this for x86, right? And then the compilers got better. And the compilers get better in a scalable way, as opposed to hard, your hand tuning, which can only go sort of linearly. Compilers just get better exponentially from that point of view. Every time you, you include an optimization into the compiler, it becomes available for everybody, right? So I had the ignominy of watching my hand tuned uh, you know, graph search um, be beaten by the, the, the compiler after a period of time simply because they were much better at doing certain types of optimizations. The same thing is going to happen here. And we, if there's one lesson to be learned uh, from, from watching classical um, computation is that what took them time to do in terms of the compiler optimization, which took about a couple of decades, they were doing that on constraint hardware. Now the constraint hardware in this space is actually the quantum side. On the classical side, we've got plenty of hardware, enormous advances in terms of like type theory and so on and so forth, where you, you can make the optimizations and have mathematical rigor back, you know, backing those up. So I actually think that the, the need to do optimization is important now but it will actually stop being as important much faster than it did for classical. So it's better to have the compiler early than, than not. That's the bet that I have. 